The DDP, the Devlin Duel Podcast, and Dooley, so much to talk about. There is so much glorious test cricket going on. I know you're at the Pakistan T20, but and I also know that you've kept an eye on these. Let's just go back briefly to Tuesday at the Basin Reserve, mate. That was just unbelievable. Yeah, seriously good. Look, you've, you've got to have, um, I think, progressive... Um, captains and and, and a, in particular a progressive captain like Ben Stokes to be able to produce results like that. Uh, no matter which way that test match went, it was just gripping to to see it on the last day. Um, you know, I sort of I woke up early enough here to watch the last hour and a half of it. It was it was just bloody unbelievable, mate. And you know, and for for England to have sort of played the the way they've been playing for the last. Eight, nine, ten months, um, and for New Zealand to bounce back after a, you know pretty, pretty m- much a mauling in that first Test match, um, for them to bounce back and to to get that result, especially following on. And when we look at what you know, what's the history? What's history say? Four times, I think, mm, in the history mm. of the game, sides have won following on. Only the second one-run victory. All those little things are just amazing. So for those people, and you know, um, for, for New Zealand cricket to open up the gates and, and make it free, I think was was a very good thing as well. So I, I hope that those that went along enjoyed it, and um, you know, the, the few that got to watch it on telly, um, I hope they enjoyed it as well. No, right. was it a wide from Wag second to last ball? Of course it was. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. But hey, you know, I look. I, I think that would have been a mistake to to end it on that note, or or to sort of um, you know, or to to make that call on that note as well. There was so much of the test match left to play, so much time left to play. I don't think it would have been the correct decision to have to have given that wide. Um, it certainly wasn't a deliberate wide. He wasn't looking to bowl it. It uh, wasn't negative tactics or any of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I had no issue with it. Uh, I, I, I love the fact that you actually fall some in your praise of England and the way that they play, because the way that they play meant that a result was possible. All results were possible. Having said that, Dolly, what was fascinating was, especially on day four, that they resorted to test match cricket type, that they were negative in their field settings, that they looked dispirited. They had their best bowlers off the field, obviously resting for the new ball, and that they almost went on and go slow. So it's not it's not like that they play rip, snort and bust every single minute of every single test match. No, and this is why the, this is why Brendan hates the term that's been coined by by one journalist, and it's sort of it's caught flavour, I suppose, because it's not about that. It is. It is about playing your natural game and playing the situation of the game. And and you saw Ben Stokes. I mean, what he about a hundred and something balls for his thirty? It's it's the situational awareness of the game. Know when you have to play conservatively, but when you don't have to play conservatively, free your mind and, and just let yourself play. And and that's what it's all about. It is not crash bang wallop. It's not slogging. It's not T Twenty cricket. In a white in white uniforms, it's nothing to do with that. And people have sort of coined that phrase or cottoned onto it. And I mean, I dislike it as well. No, I hate it's, it. Mate. I'm that's derog- why we're not saying I think it, it's no. derogatory. I actually think it's derogatory to to just a bloke who's who's allowed a team who had some very good players in it. And there's still some guys in that side that you know that will be challenged at, at test level at different times. There's still some guys whose places are under pressure, but he's allowed them to free their minds a little bit, which English cricket has at times in the last hundred years been very stuffy and been very um, regimented. And, and and it just shows you there is the talent there, the likes of the Brooks and these guys that, that have an enormous amount of talent if you just let it be and, uh, and unleash it. Yeah, I, was, I, I just thought it was a brilliant series, mate, and a real bummer that there wasn't one to finish with. Um, and you're right about New Zealand cricket opening the gates and letting it. And, there were, you know, the big shame really is that, you know, Sparks Board will never let us know, and neither will New Zealand Cricket, because they're both too embarrassed about how few people were watching. And also the confusion about what radio station has it, and where they bloody find it, and all of these kind of things. But aside from all of that, anyone that actually did take the time, uh, it's just, it's one of those most beautiful pieces of sport where you will remember what the hell you were doing, and and you love your test cricket as much as anyone does. And to go right down to the the last couple of, of, of instances of play on the final mm. day, I mean, there's no other sport in the world that can do that because nothing else goes for five days, I suppose. But And then we turn our attention to Australia versus India. And this is like a T20 <laughs> match in whites, mate. I was watching yesterday, start of day two, and all of a sudden, well, the hang on a second, India are batting again, and now they've got a lead mm-hmm. of 75 runs, and this will be over probably in the first session of, of day three. So does it matter that, it, that it, you can get a result and it doesn't take five days? 
No, exactly. I mean, and that, look, this is what India have chosen to do. Now, one thing you will see with, with Indian batters in particular, their averages are on the way down, and they're scooting down fairly quickly because they're playing at home on some fairly average pitches at the moment, very spin-friendly. And when you get good spinners up against them, and in, don't get me wrong here, the Indian batters of the modern era are certainly not a patch on a Dravid, a Lakshman, um, a Tendulkar, a, a Ganguly, a Gambia, the these sorts of players. When mm. it comes to when it comes to playing spin and quality spin, that is a, that is something they are not anywhere near as good at as they once were. The fact is they're winning at home generally because they have better spinners. But Nathan Lyon is a, an absolute gun. Here is a guy without, you know, I mean, he doesn't have a Dusra. he doesn't have a bent arm. He, he's not a Murali. He's not a Said Ajmal. He's not one of these guys. He just bowls conventional off spin. And it, his numbers are phenomenal, Marty. I mean, that was another eight-wicket haul for him. I think he's got more or equal amount of um, five-wicket hauls of any other any overseas player in India. Um, his, his, his test stats are seriously, seriously good. And, and, you know, he is a world, world-class spinner. What's, who's he gone past now? He's, he's sort of, what is he, third... I think he's only got McGrath and Warren in front of him as far in front of him as far as leading wicket takers for Australia are concerned. So you just think about that and, and it just shows you how good a player and how great a bowler he has been. He's now where is he at? Four hundred and seventy nine. Just had a quick look. Four seventy nine wickets in his career. And it's just a phenomenal career. And then, of course, South Africa West Indies. I chased the channel and that was going on in, in South Africa. So three test matches. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. It also adds up to, I mean, how good is that Ashes series going to be this year too? Because now that England is smarting, you know, I mean, they, they've only, you know, lost that one to us, but they'll be smarting. But in Australia, even if they win this and, and get out with a two-wheel draw, is still lost that trophy. So you've got two teams that will not want to be on the receiving end as far as the Ashes go. And once again, that will remain, won't it, and still be the pinnacle of Test cricket? It will, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Ashes, then the Border Gavaskar, which is going on at the moment, they're the two highlights of, of Test match cricket around the world. Um, and and they, they will always remain that way. Uh, you know, I can't wait, Marty. I'll be in, the su- I'll be in England for the whole summer. And, um, you know, I just can't wait to, to watch and, and, and keep an eye on the Ashes. And just, um, it, it's going to be a heck of a series, I think. If England continue to play, the way they play you can't always be overly aggressive against good bowling attacks and that's why i'm pleased that new zealand were able to bounce back a little bit from that uh, from the mount monganui if it were i just thought they were a little wayward and they, they, they didn't really have their plans sorted so i was pleased in that front that they really bounced back quite nicely in in wellington um so yeah it'll be a heck of an ashes series in, in england for the summer it's it's just going to be cracking I'd hate to drop this one in on you, mate, but today in 2009, something horrendous happened in Pakistan. You'll know what it was. The Sri Lankan bus was attacked. It would happen today, 14 years ago. So 14 years later, you're there playing the Pakistani T20 competition is going on. It's amazing, isn't it? That it's just, I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago when you think about it like that, but obviously a hell of a lot has changed in that time. Yeah, it has. Look, we drove past the um, the area, actually, um, just when we left the ground tonight. We drove past the exact spot where it happened, um, and it's now into a it's now a big roundabout. It's no longer a sort of a through crossroads. It's a big roundabout. They've uh, put a lot of lights and fanfare up in and around the area. Um, you know, we're, we're still in, in some sh- way, shape, and form in security convoys going to and from the game. Um do I feel 100% safe? I mean, I, I could say the same thing about going to London. I was in London when the machete attacks have, have happened. I've been oh, in London nice when, there's right. been bombs, mm. when there's been bombs gone off. You know, I mean, look, is it more worrying, more likely to happen here, possibly? Uh, do I understand why teams um, are, are wary of touring here? Absolutely. But when you see the flip side of it, when you see the, the public and the people and the love for the game. And I mean, seriously, the people that just cannot thank you enough for coming to their country. I, I think that's the one thing I notice more than anything. I get messages and, and people coming to me time and time again. I mean, you know, handfuls and handfuls and dozens on a daily basis saying, cannot thank you enough for coming to our country. You know, we know what it means. We, we know how hard it can be. We know how tough the decision is to make to come here 
because of what's happened and, and what could possibly happen. So we, we, we appreciate it more than you will ever, ever know. And, and that's the one thing I take from it. Um, you know, and, and I guess there is, there's always that thought in the back of your mind, but we, we get looked after incredibly well. Uh, uh, and, you, you know, if you don't worry about going to a place like London or, or Boston or, or, or New York at times when, when certain things have happened, then, you know, you, 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 I mean, if you were that worried about it, Marty, you wouldn't hardly go anywhere in the That's world. That's true. Yeah, I mean, well, you wouldn't drive you wouldn't drive in parts of South Auckland. You wouldn't drive in parts of East Auckland. You wouldn't go to West mm. Auckland, mate. There are all kinds of bits of New Zealand at the moment, you know, uh, flood-ravaged bits of the East Coast, Hawke's Bay, where, you know, they mm. say it's lawless. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, you know... Yeah, mm. it's just I just wanted to mark the moment though, and just you know think yeah, how how absolutely. how things change. And, and, and talking to people, talking to people that were there, you know, I mean, I still still see Simon Telfel, um on a regular basis. He was in the bus, um, you know, they they watched the guy with the with the rocket launcher um, trip over and 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 sort of fire it into the ground, and then it went up over top of the bus rather than into the bus because he fell over as he was about to fire it. Um, you know, Summer Summer Awera, uh, with bullet holes in his uh, in his knee, shrapnel in his knee. Guys that were shot at in the van. When you, you talk to these people, they probably have a slightly different view mm. on it than, than we do. Um, and and you know that's that's part and parcel of it. You talk to the New Zealand guys that were here oh. um, when the bomb went off. Yeah. You know, Robbie Hart was blown across the room. He, he still sort of thinks about it. Stephen Fleming walking out of the hotel reception and seeing body parts all over the place. You know, uh, people who have been in and amongst it and seen it uh, are always, I think, affected slightly differently. Happier topic to talk about to finish with. I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to watch it tonight, and I hope that you can. I hope it's not ring-fenced and you get it. The Warriors start again tonight, mate. And I know, I know (laughs) that this year, Simon, things are going to be different. It's our year, Marty. Come it's on. the year of the Warriors. You've got to it's say it. It's our year. You know Surely. it. Surely. You've got to say it. Can I go through some stats <laughs> for you, mate? you on the wagon. The last four years, if you work out the win percentages, 9, 8, 8, and 6, it's 33%. Last year, they won six games out of 24. They won two out of the last 16. These are the bare facts laid bare. So as much as we do live in hope and as much as we've got a new coach and everything else, look, the only thing that counts is whether or not they actually start winning games but at this particular time this is the last day before the season starts that every Warriors fan just allows <laughs> ourselves a little bit of love don't we oh it is mate it is what I mean I'm just sort of looking what would be uh, what would be a success does it have to be a top eight to be a success well I think that's it, isn't it that, yeah I think that's a raging success and that to me is saying it's a failure I mean come on there's 16 or 17 teams. You've got to make the top eight. But for this team, yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as we start qualifying and saying, oh, what, 10th is okay, or as long as we actually play with pride, or as long as we tackle, as long as we don't give up. I mean, it's a professional bloody sports side, mate. We've got to consider it that. Yeah. Aren't we there to win it? Yeah, well, that's the thing, isn't it? You, you've got to think that we are there to win it. But, I mean, uh, when you start saying, or when, you, when you're looking at a new coach and, and building a new team and maybe trying to build for the next two, three years, I think you've got to give coaches two to three years to mould their style of play, to mould the way they want to play. Is it is it top eight this year? Is it is it semi finals? You know, is it top four next year? That sort of thing. Where do you sort of where do you draw the line on this? I, I don't know. I mean I I would I'd say Jeepers, if we're anywhere near the top eight at the at the, at the crux of the season, crux end of the you know back end of the season, you'd be pretty happy. 